open is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. I raise a hallelujah with everything. Hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of a mystery. I raise a Yeah. 
you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. and many things of people dealing with some major circumstances, some very hard circumstances. And the Lord brought me to 2 Kings. And there was a, a man by the na name of Naaman, if I'm pronouncing that right. He was a captain of an army. And he fought and he won many battles, one after the other after the other. At the same time, he was dealing with leprosy. He was dealing with a major illness, a major situation, but he was winning battle after battle for the king. And he went to the king and he, he said, I need you to call on your God to heal me. And the king ripped his clothes and said, I, don't, I can't do that, I don't know how to do that. And then he found out about, about, about a prophet and the prophet heard about Naaman. And he went to Naaman and he said, you need to go down to the river and wash seven times and you'll be made whole. Well, Naaman, that's not what he wanted to hear. He wanted the prophet to say, you're healed, be whole, go your way. That's not what happened. There are circumstances and situations that they're not turning out like we think they should. You may be fighting and winning battle after battle, but you're fighting an illness at the same time. It does not make any sense. There's no reasoning, you, you don't understand it. And you, you go to who you think could give you the answer and they're like, I don't have the answer. But we know that Jesus is the answer. Naaman found a prophet who knew who Jesus was, a prophet who knew who God was that could heal him and change him. And even though Naaman did not want to go, Maybe he was embarrassed to be seen washing in the river. He was the captain of an army and he was fighting leprosy, but at the same time he was like, I can't go wash in the river, everybody's gonna see me. That's just my opinion on it. I mean, I don't know what he was thinking, but he was hesitant, he didn't wanna go do that. How many times has God told us to do things and we don't wanna do them because it's not what we thought was the right answer. God is telling us today to just listen and obey. If you'll follow after me, I will make you clean. I will make you whole, even when it doesn't make any sense. The word is full of people having to fight battles and go through things. Naaman was cleansed and he was made whole. I wanna encourage you today, this is your opportunity to go before the Lord and say, God, whatever you tell me to do, to get my deliverance, to get my freedom, to get my wholeness, I will do. Even if it doesn't make sense, even if others laugh at me and say, why are you doing that? Your God's not gonna listen to you. Today is your opportunity. Take this opportunity. If you feel that you wanna come to the altar, don't worry what people say. This is your opportunity. This is your chance to have freedom. This is your chance to be made whole. We have to stop worrying about what other people are thinking or saying or doing. We want deliverance. We want healing. We want change. Do we want it bad enough to stop worrying of what other people are saying or thinking? Naaman got his healing and his deliverance when he chose to follow after God and go to the river. 
He didn't have to just go to the river one time. He didn't have to dip one time. He had to dip seven times. I think what God was saying was, are you going to be obedient? I didn't tell God could have healed him after one time. But God said, no, I want you to do it seven times. You know, I'm sure by that time, crowds were gathering around saying, what are you doing? What are you doing dipping in the river? But he came up out of the river. He came up out of that place whole and healed. This is your opportunity today. We're going to worship the king. And we're going to call out to him. And we're going to say, God, whatever you ask us to do, we will do. God, we just thank you for the opportunity. God, we thank you that no matter what you tell us to do, God, that we will honor you, we will exalt you, we will praise you. No matter what others say or do, we will not lose this opportunity. We will take this opportunity to worship you today and to listen for that still small voice that tells us what to do. There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atone One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn what sacrifice was made as the heavens roll all hail King Jesus all hail the Lord of heaven and earth all hail King All hail the Savior of the world. There was a moment when the sky lit up, a flash of light breaking through. The king of life was on the move For in a dark old tomb Where our Lord was laid One miraculous prayer And we're forever changed oh. Savior of 
say something real quick about worship, and that's, you know, praise is when we're when we're exalting God and we're when we're thanking Him for what He's done and we're, you know, magnifying what He's done. But then we come to that place where we move into worship, and you know, worship is a deeper, more intimate thing. It's where our hearts pour out the love and the intimacy of our souls unto our God, unto our Lord and our Savior and our Redeemer. It is an intimate, it is a personal, it's an amazing thing. And it should be the heart cry of all believers. But here at Family Worship Center, it is a part of our identity. It's a part of who we are as a body of believers here. Worship is one of the things that characterizes who we are. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you for your presence here among your people. Lord, we thank you. accept our praises as your people and that you accept the worship of our hearts and Lord God that you respond by pouring out your presence by moving upon us with your Holy Spirit by rising up within us Lord God with your glory that indwells us Father we just thank you God I pray that you are that you would just move with special about in this section? Any first time visitors? In the, in the middle section, any first time visitors? Okay, we got some over here. Over here, some first time visitors. Welcome. God bless you. Thank you for coming and joining with us. On the far side, any any first time visitors over here? Anyone else? Well, thank you for coming and joining with us. We're glad to have you here. So, um, I want to talk about uh, the children for a minute. You know, we are blessed with just some wonderful children. And this church here has a focus on the youth, on the next generation, and the generation following, and the generation following to raise our children up in the way they should go so that later they don't depart from that, that there's always that presence in their heart. And the children here are, if you just watch them, they just love the Lord. And they love in being in the presence of God. I've never seen a, a place where children are excited to go to children's church. I, I've never seen anything like it in my life. It's an amazing, and it's born, I believe, through generations of people, of families who love the Lord and who train up their children. And so right now, Lord, we just speak a blessing upon the children, God, that your blessing would rest upon them, that your favor would rest upon them, that your protection, divine protection would rest upon them, Lord God that you would guide their steps throughout the course of their lives. And no matter what they face in life, Lord God, that you would cause it to rise up within them, that faith that's buried deep in their hearts, and they'd reach out and lay hold of you, Lord God, and that they would hear your voice guiding them in their journey in Jesus' name. Okay, the children can be dismissed to go to the children's church. To the The first time guests, um, we, there is a gift for you. I guess it's in the foyer. So if you, after service, if you'll go to the foyer, you can receive your gift. Shane, Shane's going to do ties this morning. Good morning, everyone. For the what third time so far. Um. While I was sitting down, there was a mate, uh, just a mighty presence of God in the building. Today. I think it'd be unfortunate if we let it slip from our focus as we shifted gears. Anytime God wants to visit with us, it's important that we focus there. As I was sitting there, and I, before I do tithes and offering, I, I can't let this go. I had a feeling that so many times we as Christians don't feel like we can do what God's called us to do because of the position that we're in, things that we've done wrong, things that we've done wrong last week, 
the way people view us. I've got a son that's in a wheelchair, and God has called him to pray and lay his hands on people and see him healed. If you can't think of a more quandary type of thing than that, I don't know what to say. But I promise you, if you're in a service with Gabriel and you let him come and pray for you, something in your life is going to change. And he has had people say things to him about being in a wheelchair and praying for other people. And Gabriel's response is, I'm just laying seed because eventually I'm going to be standing up and praying for people. Yeah. You can't let the enemy rob your place by letting you focus on things that you think you felt God in. There's a, and this is part of this today, there's an old proverb that says, please love me when you think I least need it because that's when I need it the most. And I believe that's the way God looks at us all the time. So, sorry. It's just overwhelming for me today with the anointing of God that's up here in this building. What he's trying to do, what he's trying to do is reach to where we're at, get us motivated to move beyond ourselves, to move out and love on people. So that's part of the, the tithes and offerings. Is, I don't know how many messages I've heard about tithes and offerings, but it basically boils down to a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle of being a giver. If you aren't prepared to give an offering until the offering is called, you might want to talk to God about that in prayer. You should be ready to give when you show up. To me, people are ready for praise and worship. They're ready for song service. Some people are ready for preaching. But giving should never be an afterthought. To me, it should be just as important as anything else. Because what it does is it ties me in to the character of God. First and foremost, God is God, but he has always been a giver. And what he does is he allows us to be a giver so we can allow the anointing of God to flow through us. It's not about I give God something, he owes me 10 back, 7% back, sevenfold. It's about I give to God. And it allows me to be a channel, a conduit, to be able to give to people who really need it. And, you know, sometimes if somebody, one of your friends, and I hate moving. Moving is one of the worst things you can ever do. I'd rather burn my house down than move. I mean, I just hate it. But, <laughs> but you know, sometimes people need help moving. And a couple of hours of time to go help somebody here move, and that is being a big time giver. It's not about money per se, it's about heart behind it. And I'm not talking about the next five minutes about you giving. I'm talking about the next 50 years of your life, where you're going to move from, and who you're going to become. It's important to be a giver, to be a conduit, because out of all the people that are around you, wherever you're at, somebody has to be the conduit for God to move through. So I feel the challenge today, is it going to be you? Are you going to be the conduit? Now, you can give your money now, which we would really appreciate. But take the message outside of this and live a lifestyle of being a giver. The last thoughts I want to leave with you is something I read that kind of hit me hard this week was our habits define us and create our destiny and if my habits don't line up with where I want to be with God I've got to change my habits so guys I'm going to pray before we take up tithe and offering and then I'd ask the ushers to be ready Father we come before you in the name of Jesus Lord I ask you to bless your people, to bless the offering. Father, I declare that the hand of favor 
is upon every person and every family connected with this church. According to Psalms 512, declare the favor of God over their life. Favor is not fair, it's just the hand of God. So we declare it, we receive it. Father, the money that comes in, we commit it to you to meet needs, to bless the, the, the community around us. And Father, let it be seeds of your anointing, your light, where it goes and where it touches. We loose laborers to this community. Let it be me, God. Let it be us to be the conduit that makes a difference. Father, and allow us to learn how to worship you through our giving. We thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please bring your offerings. Uh, electronic giving is in the back. And uh, y'all can get them run up here. It's okay. All right, thank you. to sing a special this morning and it's it's going along with what God is trying to say today he's trying to talk to you today to let you know he's got things worked out he's got change coming he's just asking for you to reach for him and be obedient there is a, a special anointing in here today for change there's an anointing in here for a difference in your life
somebody here is wanting to give up. Somebody here, you've been ready to quit. But my God says wait, hold on, you just wait, cause it ain't over. Somebody needs to declare that to your neighbor. It ain't over yet. How wonderful, wonderful. You may be seated. That makes me want to preach. Told Pastor Edmund, I said, after conference, I'm retiring again. He said, can you preach on the 18th? It ain't over yet. That's the title of my message today. It ain't over yet. There's no time to give up. No time to throw in the towel. It ain't over yet. You need to sing that all day tomorrow and today. Get that down in your spirit. Sing, it ain't over yet. It ain't over yet. It ain't over. Wow. I want to lay a little foundation for where I'm going with this today. In the book of 2 Kings, chapter 20, I may not read all of them, but verses 1 through 5. It said, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Set your house in order, because you're going to die. I always understood, and I have preached That prophecy is for three things. It's for edification, exhortation, and comfort. I couldn't find that in that prophecy. I saw no edification, so no, no exhortation. I didn't even see any comfort. You're going to die. Set your house in order. Make out your last will and testimony because you're going to die. You need to put somebody in charge of your large estate. This is a king we're talking to. Put somebody in charge of everything that you have because Uncle John wants this. Pastor Jerry Ed always says, I'm going to get your truck. My stepdad used to tell me when I'm gone, I will leave you a nice car with big payments. And he did. I have a beautiful small pulpit that we used to have up here with a marble top that Bill made and beautiful Glenn Parker said, when you go, I want it. I don't know if he's trying to hurry up the situation or not. But he told Hezekiah, set your house in order. Find somebody that will be the administrator off of your vast estate. I don't know, but I've got a feeling that Hezekiah started singing that song. It ain't over yet. The Bible said that Hezekiah went up against the wall and he began to weep and he began to bargain with God. Say, God doesn't bargain. Wait a minute. He said, come, let us reason together. Come, let's talk about this thing. 
He, God is not an unreasonable God. He said, let us reason together. You tell me what your feelings are and I will tell you mine. Hezekiah said, God, I have walked before you in truth. I have been the man of God that you have called me to be. I have done everything that is within my power to be the child of God that I am supposed to be. God said, wait a minute. It ain't over yet. He said, I, I've, I've heard your prayers. I've seen your tears. I'm going to add 15 years to your life because God said, it ain't over yet. This is not my message. I'm just laying a little found, uh, foundation here. He said, I'm gonna add 15 years to your life and in three days, you will return to the house of the Lord. And then Isaiah, he spoke to Isaiah before he ever got out of the courtroom of the big palace. And he said, tell him I'm adding 15 years to his life and you go get some figs. He had a sore, the Bible called it a boil, but you don't usually die from a boil. I believe the, the, the Bible scholars declare it was a cancer. But he told Isaiah, go get some figs. How many here know what a poultice is? How many do not know what a poultice is? Just the young ones. A poultice is something that you uh, put on. Well, let me tell you, my mother put one on me. Man, I used to have big old boils come up on the back of my... She would scrape a potato and put it on a bandage and slap it on my neck and declaring it would pull the poison out of that and be healed. He told Isaiah, go get some figs. He didn't call it a poultice. He said, put some figs on the sore, on the boil, on the cancer. And in three days, it will draw the poison out and he can return to the house of the Lord. God was saying, Hezekiah, it ain't over yet. Some of you have given up hope, said, I, I'm too old to do anything for God now. It ain't over yet. Sing the song. Get it in your spirit. It ain't over yet. I've wasted all these years. It ain't over yet. I appreciated what Leslie said during conference. 2020 isn't even over yet. We have things to do. We have fish to fry. And we're going to brown them on both sides. Amen, amen. It ain't over yet. Drive on, preacher. I'm now to my message. It's found in Genesis chapter 17. Many of you have given up hope on some things and we give God three reasons why we can't fulfill our vision. I'm too young. I'm too old. I have no money, no one will listen to me. I am a sinner, I just can't, make, I can't live right. You're the ones I wanna to preach to. And if you're already perfect, please listen quietly. <laughs> Genesis chapter 17, verse one, when Abram was 90 years old and nine. He was an old man, older than me. The Lord God appeared to Abram and said unto him, 
I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and I will, I will multiply thee exceedingly. See, you remember God ratified that covenant by, uh, by himself because Abram had fallen asleep and fell over. So he ratified, he could find no greater to counsel with, so he counseled with himself. Abram fell on his face and God talked to him while he had fallen on his face saying, as for me, behold my covenant is with thee, thou shalt be a father of many nations. Do I have your attention? He said, neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Past tense, already done. I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations out of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Wow, what a, what a word. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee. Talking to this old man. In their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. God introduces himself to Abram and he said, I am the Lord God. Abram fell on his face and God began to speak. I will make thee a father of many nations. God speaks in a way that only God can speak. He had fallen on his face and God began to speak to him. Wow. He said, your name shall no longer be Abram, but Abraham. It wasn't a request. It wasn't a suggestion. It was a command. Your name shall be called Abraham, which means the father of many nations. Just who do you think you are, Abram, Abraham? I'm an old man. I have no children. My wife is old and she's well stricken in years. Just who do you think you are? Well, I'm the man that can't. Begin to give God excuses. Now I'm too old, God. And God said, you are going to be the father of many nations. <laughs> you should have told me that when I was 35. God said, I'm telling you now. Does God work in impossible situations? The impossible with God doesn't even take any longer. Bear with me. Our excuses start, I'm a worm, <laughs> I am nothing. And God began to explain to him, I want to show you who you really are. I want to show you what's going to begin to take place in your life. God can't tell you everything up front because you haven't gone it through anything. If you haven't gone through any trials, you really don't know much about winning. Everybody's quiet. That just means you're listening. I don't know if there's any old people here or not. There might be one, two, maybe even three. You have to go through a certain amount of failures before you can realize the victory. Suddenly you realize after you hit about mm, so many years, you begin to come to the realization, I'm really not as smart as I used to think I was. If I had been smarter, I wouldn't have done this. And I sure wouldn't have gone here. And sometimes our smartness doesn't even come in until we're up in years. Somebody told me the other day, we need to hear from you because we, uh, we know that gray hair is a sign of wisdom. I said, don't you believe it? I said, I know some gray-haired fools. <laughs> I 
It's staggering when you get to the end of your road and God says, God shows up and said, and it shows up when you're all out of options. You're all out of ideas. God, why did you show up now that I'm 99 years old and why not when I was 18? George Burns sang a song, I wish I was 18 again. I've wished that many times. Why didn't you talk to me, God, about this when I had all my strength? Why did you wait till I became so old and decrepit? And my wife, have you seen her? Uh, I could hear God say, you weren't ready yet. I'm almost 100 years old. When do, I, when do you think I'm going to get ready? You know, God begins to speak and to speak to him in a different kind of language. And I can hear old Abraham say, well, Sarah, here's this. He said, she is well stricken in years. It's no wonder she laughed. There is a process that we must go through to get to the promise. When you've gone through enough stuff, your level of reception is much higher. If you've gone through some sickness, you might even have a little bit of uh, pity on somebody else even. You might feel a little bit sorry for them. God probably didn't understand that Abraham was 99 years old. He probably had the papers mixed up. But he had run out of options he had run out of ideas. He was old and he had nothing to offer. His knees were wrinkled. His back was weak. His sight was bad. And he could hardly hear. But God said, now you're in position. Now you're the one I can talk to. You know, I, my dad used to tell a little story about the young man that uh, was getting ready to preach. The old pastor was sitting there with him and he called him up to preach and this young man just come up. Come up on that platform. He was, he was ready to go. And he got up there and he took a freeze. And he got some stage fright. And he just mumbled and through the whole thing and he went down and sat down by the old pastor and the old pastor said young man if you'd have gone up there the way you came down you'd have come down the way you went up there hello sometimes God hasn't given us enough to do he has to put us through some things before we can understand the reality of success. He had run out of options, his knees were wrinkled, his back was bent and his sight was withering away. He had no heirs, no one to leave his stuff to. No children. And besides that, Sarah was barren. I would imagine the attitude, but has God gone mad? He had struggled unsuccessfully to become the father of one. And here comes God. I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Kings are going to come out of you. Does that give you any kind of a stir at all? I'm here to tell you that God is in charge and it ain't over yet. It ain't over yet. I'm trying to stick to my notes so I don't go off on a bunny trail. God will bring into alignment that which is out of order. But I've done this, God. He said, you did? I don't remember that. But God, I failed you over here. He said, you did? 
He said, I forgot about that. He said, your sins and your iniquities will I remember no more. When your sins are gone, they have been eradicated from the mind of God. You are the only one that remembers them. Put them beneath the blood. Put the blood of Christ over those mistakes and those failures and those disappointments, those hurts, those times of fierce anger and those moral failures. Put them under the blood because God is saying to you today, it ain't over yet. It ain't over. God doesn't really care how old you are. He doesn't even care how weak you are. He's looking at your destiny. What is that? That's your preordained future that maybe you haven't even been made aware of yet. Wow. Could it really be that the latter part of my life would be more productive than the former part of my life? Some of us didn't even get any sense till we was 35 years old. Amen. I know there, that's, I'm just talking to the, the uh, up here on the platform, that's all. But some of us up here didn't have any sense till we 35, 40, 50 years old after we had gone through some things. If God said it, maybe we ought to believe it. I don't know if you have any strength as a man. He said, I don't know if you have any seed left. Waiting for you to run out of seed so I can give you mine. Sarah's womb will recognize it when it hits that womb. It's not the seed of Abraham. It's the seed of God that's going through Abraham. Are you listening to me? It means quickened and brought back to life. God can take that which is dead and he can make it live. God calls this old man, calls this old impotent man to be the father of many nations. God calls him this childless man <laughs> to do something far beyond human ability. He said, Abraham, there's a nation inside of you. There is a people on the inside of you. There are nations on the inside of you. What is he saying to you? Some of you have been on, sitting on the promises of God for 40 years and you will not move off of those promises because you don't have the ability. You're too old, you're too young, you're too dumb. It's not about your past. It's not even about your future. It's about your unborn potential. Amen. Un your unborn potential. About things that haven't come together yet. About places you have never been. God said, I desire to take you places in, the, in, the, in my life that you have never been. God does more in a struggle than he does in the calm. I'm going to make you a father when you don't even feel like a man. There was no arrogance in Abraham. He said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. I'm not even a man anymore. I've lost my manhood. God said, now I can use you. Are you folks understanding this? I'm going to make you a father when you don't even feel like a man anymore. I'm, I've been waiting for your factory to shut down. 
I've been waiting for your body to shut down. All of your circumstances now are endless. Nothing is going your way. With mounting circumstances, can't make ends meet anymore. But now, let's skip down about 42 generations. Everybody know where, we, where we're going. It ain't over till God says it's over. It ain't over yet. A young Hebrew girl, 42 generations later, found herself a laughing stock because she had become pregnant and was not married and was no government to pick her up. She wasn't married to this young man and he wasn't the father. I don't know if some, some of you may know who I'm talking about. They called his name Yeshua. 42 generations later, called his name Yeshua. And he was born and he was laid in a manger. I'm still talking about the seed of Abraham. I read another verse that said, if ye be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed. In the Abraham was many nations, many children, many kings, but I found out that the king of all kings came through the seed of Abraham. I am the seed of Abraham. I'm who God says I am. I am not who the world says I am. I have things to do. I have places to go. I refuse to quit. I quit one time. I preached a terrible message one Sunday morning right here in this pulpit. I mean, it was terrible. I went home, I said, I quit. I quit. I mean, I quit the ministry then. I didn't preach again till Wednesday night. <laughs> How many times have you quit? I know, just me and Brent. We're the only ones here that's quit but we're still here because God said it ain't over yet. <laughs> I still have people to see. I still have prayers to pray. I have people to lay hands on. I have people to watch being delivered by the power of an almighty God because it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, or all of your excuses. God said it ain't over yet. You can get that down in your spirit, not in your head, but get it in your spirit that God said, it ain't over yet. Your circumstances do not have the ability to dictate your future. Hallelujah. I'm about through, I think. I believe this calls for a shout declaring I am the seed of Abraham. Now I, I'm old and I can put my head in the air now. I found out I am the seed of Abraham. I know who God says I am. It doesn't matter who anybody else says I, I know who I am. I know where who my God is. Amen. It ain't over yet. Are you aware it doesn't even matter the doctor's diagnosis? All they do is practice. I don't 
belittle them. They do a great job. But God said, it ain't over yet. Maybe we need to have reasoning with him. God, you don't understand. Look here. My age is creeping up on me. Pastor Edmund said, said, will you preach on the 18th? Called me on the way on their trip. He said, will you preach on the night of the 18th? Yeah. Will you preach next week in Oklahoma? Yeah. It ain't over yet. When I told him I was retired, he said, and just what are you going to do? I said, just whatever I want to do. I'm preaching next week for a man that is 88 years old. Evidently, God said it ain't over yet. Still pastoring. He was the state representative, I guess that's, I don't know what they called him, for the Pentecostal Church of God. still pastoring. I asked Pastor Ed, I said, did you know uh, this brother McDowell? He said, yes, I knew him. He said, I knew him well. When I first started in the ministry, he would let me play the piano for him and he would pat me on the head and say, you're gonna make it, young man. <laughs> so I go up there next Sunday to preach for him. Maybe he will pat me on the head and say, you're going to make it, young man. All I'm saying, it ain't over. <laughs> I don't know about, I, do you ever get a song in your spirit and you, you just won't leave? I, I have songs in my head continually. I wake up four o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. I'm not kidding. I'm not, not play. I have a song wherever. I, it's going continually. It's nonstop. Some of them aren't really that good either. <laughs> but the, they just keep going. But now, what I'm saying to you, let that song be birthed in your spirit. It ain't over till God says it's over. That's better than you picked a fine time to leave me, Lucille. <laughs> Say amen, Bill. <laughs> he, he's scared. He wouldn't even say amen. Maybe you need to examine who you are. I'm nothing. Remove that from your thinking. You are who God says you are. Amen? I told the kings this morning I was going to aim at them. Did I hit you? Well, I was, it's hard to miss when you take dead aim. I was also aiming at Bill Hingston. It ain't over, bud. Every one of us, it ain't over yet. We have things to do for the kingdom of God. Say, I don't have the ability. Oh, he wouldn't have called you if you didn't have the ability. Well, I've retired again. But the flame hadn't gone out. <laughs> Don't tell Pastor Edmund what time we're going to get out of here. <laughs> We've got time to hear, go out of here and go to another church. I know you heard about the 
the guy that was marooned on an island for a bunch of years and they couldn't find him. Finally, a ship came along and they found him and it had three buildings out there. So, well, what are these three buildings? He said, well, this one here is where I live. And this one over here is where I go to church. They said, well, what is that other one? He said, that's where I used to go to church. The Bible said we'd be planted like a tree by the rivers of living water. Some people are still in the back of the truck. Hello. Well, no excuses. It's only 1122. We can beat the Baptist to the restaurant. Is everybody blessed? Are you going to be singing all day? Are you going to be singing all night? Amen. Is this the amen corner over here? It ain't over yet. Maybe it's time to get up and exercise. Oh. I have to be careful here. No name, no blame. Somebody told me they get up and do all these push-ups every morning. And I said, that's why you look so good. Where'd she go? Oh, she's back there. No, I'm not naming her. Just saying. I know they're getting ready to sing and I'm getting ready to shut up and sit down. Thank you for listening. I believe you were listening. I don't believe you were just hearing. I believe you were listening. It ain't over. It ain't over. <laughs> that stirs me. It ain't over. One little quick story. They're going to sing, but I was preaching at a, a revival in Wichita, Kansas. And uh, the st I went downtown to a little Chinese restaurant after church one, one night. It was snowing. It was cold. Went out to get back in my car and it wouldn't start. And I knew that the starter was getting weak, but you know, you don't do it till you need it. And I, what took me a taxi down to the parts house the next morning, walked back to my hotel and came back the next morning, got a starter and here I am laying under that car, freezing rain and cold outside. They probably saw some wino rolled under there right on Broadway, right downtown Wichita. Here I am underneath that car, replacing that starter, and I caught myself singing. And I said it out loud to myself. I, I talk to myself quite often, more often now than I used to. And I said, what are you doing singing? And my answer was, I have a song. <laughs> I have a song. I don't know if you know that. That's glorious to have a song. Some people don't have any go anything coming from them but bad, bad diagnoses. Doctors' opinions, people's opinion. Who cares? God said, it ain't over till it's over. Hallelujah. Sing that song. I know who I am. I know. 